So welcome and thank you for joining us today. I know we've got folks from across Canada and elsewhere. Um, I wanna welcome you to this expert education presentation from the Sash Bear Foundation. I'm Carol Moffitt. I am a volunteer with the Sash Bear Foundation. And equally, and sometimes I think more importantly, I am a family member who has benefited from family connections and all the other resources offered by Sash Bear. Our family loves everything Sash Bear. I am joined by Lynn Corey, our co-founder for Sash Bear. Welcome, it's excited to be here with you. And also joined by Barb and Trisha, um, other volunteers at Sash Bear and, and co-facilitators. Um, and they're gonna help keep an eye on the chat with me. And actually they're just doing everything behind the scenes. They are the magic that is going to make this presentation work and I am grateful for them. Before we get started tonight, I also wanted to talk to you about the Sash Bear Walk, which is coming up. Um, it's happening right now. The Sash Bear Walk is the largest event of its kind for Borderline Personality Disorder, or BPD. It's raising awareness and reducing the stigma to help ensure everyone has the skills and supports they need for a life worth living. We've already had two great events in Ottawa and Burnaby, and we're hoping you'll be able to join us in person at our upcoming Toronto walk on May 26th, or our St. John's walk on June 15th. Or there's an option to organize a neighborhood event in your own community. The walk also serves as a fundraiser to help Sash Bear continue providing programs such as Family Connections and this webinar series. So please make a donation to our walk campaign. You can find more info on our website or at the links that are being put into the chat right now. We also invite you to watch as Canada is going orange across the country, with major Canadian landmarks being lit up in orange to raise awareness for BPD. Health Canada has just recognized May as the month of awareness for borderline personality disorders, and many cities across Canada have recognized this by lighting up their major landmarks in orange. With all that said, thank you again for joining us tonight, and I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Galen. So Jillian Galen is a senior child and adolescent psychologist specializing in dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT. She is the director of training for the Three East Continuum at McLean Hospital in Boston. She has extensive experience with diagnosing and treating adolescents and young adults who struggle with emotion dysregulation, anxiety, depression, trauma, self-injury, and suicidal behaviors. Dr. Galen is the co-author of several books, most recently, DBT for Dummies. And there are other sessions that she has done for us, um, but tonight we welcome Jillian to talk to us about managing our emotions. Welcome, Jillian, over to you. Thank you, thank you so much for having me here. It's always, um, it's such a privilege to be here and I really, um, Hold spe such a special place in my heart for Sash Bear. Um, come to the walk. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> my whole family is going to be there. It's become our tradition and we just love it. Um, and for some shameless self-promotion, but Blaze told me I had to do this to let people know, we have just finished the DBT for Dummies workbook, which will come out uh, on Amazon in July. So people are often asking for a workbook. There you go. Okay. So I'm actually gonna sit on the title slide for a second um, because I got uh, forwarded to me an incredible email. Um, you may or may not, if you're on here, know that I got it and we're gonna talk about it. Um, but I got a wonderful email um, with questions about the title. <laughs> um, and the, the question was um, that this title made this person, and I'm sure you are not the only person, let me see, um, believe that the emotions of fear, anger, sadness, guilt, and shame are always awful and serve no purpose, um, though there was an acknowledgement that they got some creed, um, and that this parent's experience, which is so common, I hear this all the time, um, which is um, that Far too often, um, they don't express their own emotions to their child. Um, and many, many people that I talk to about this are given explicit um, directions from providers saying like, don't burden your child with your emotion, your emotions, don't share them, 
Um, it's not safe to share them, all sorts of stuff. So um, wonderful, wonderful question. Um, that is not the intention. Um, the idea is how do we actually um, think about our emotions and use our emotions skillfully? Because I think far too often um, parents don't get guidance, right? And this is what's so wonderful about family connections and um, parent skills group is that my general position is that parents are an underserved population in this um, in this group. That kids that struggle, um, they could be adult children or younger children um, that struggle with emotion dysregulation require a lot of resources, right? They require a lot of support and often um, parents are left without a lot of support. And what we know is that when you support parents and you skill parents up, um, kids do better, parents do better, families do better, um, marriages do better. So um, we're going to actually talk about how you can use your emotions, okay? And sometimes it's going to be effective to share emotions with your child, and sometimes it may not be. But I want to make sure that we don't get polarized, that nothing is all, all or nothing here, um, and that, you know, sometimes it's going to be effective to share emotions, and sometimes it may not be. And I want to give you a set of skills that's going to make it effective when maybe you do share. So I'm looking forward to more questions about this. Okay. So I want to just take a second. I found this really, what I thought was sort of interesting um, graphic of the parent brain. Um, and if you dig into it, you know, look at all of the things that happen when we parent, right? So we've got strong emotions. We've got uh, thinking and humor and hopefully mindfulness and attention and creativity and hope and kindness and self-confidence. And, and then we've got these little things, which I think are so important to pay attention. So if you take a look um, right above the ear, maybe to in the front, you see a little bit of rage. You see our own urges and impulses, right? You see our knee-jerk reactions, and we see stuff that we do without thinking or blowing up, right? These are all the things that come with the emotions that we have. And, you know, what we know is that when kids are struggling and they have strong emotions, us as parents are going to have strong emotions, right? It's, it's the nature of it. I can't tell you the number of parents that have shared with me that it, what really resonates with them is, you know, I'm only as happy as my least happy child. Okay, so we have emotions. It's normal as a parent to have emotions. Um, and you know what can be really, you know, fascinating is sometimes we can regulate our emotions really, really well when we are at work with friends out in the world. And then actually when we're with our children who may be suffering, it becomes much harder. Okay. And then those are the cases that we need sort of extra specific skills to help us out. So I bring the, I often show this slide um, when I am working with parents because when you have a child that struggles with emotion dysregulation, when you have a child that struggles with self-injury or suicidal ideation or behaviors or any kinds of, of behaviors that put them in danger, okay, it has a profound impact on parents. And you know what people often don't think about is that parents are first responders for their children. Okay, we are the ones that are on the front lines and that has a huge impact on us. So I found this very, this very interesting data. So if we pull up the numbers, okay, this is the prevalence of trauma by occupation. Okay, so you start with the general population and then you start to think about different groups that um, you would think would have trauma, so maybe social workers, oncologists, substance use clinicians, people that work in violent sexual crimes, the military, uh, certainly the emergency room first responders, child protective services, and then look what's all the way at the end, okay? This is parents of living, parents of children with life-threatening behaviors, okay? Those with self-injury and those that have engaged in suicide. So if you are parenting a child, right, that is struggling, that is often traumatic for many people, 
which adds a whole nother layer of strong emotions, okay? So we as parents have to pay attention, right? We often need support. So what I thought might be helpful, and since I come from the DBT world, um, I'm going to teach DBT skills because um, that's what I do, okay? So here, what I've broken down, which I'm gonna talk about are five skills to help you manage your emotions so that they don't get in the way, okay? So it's not that we're gonna have them not get in the way by stuffing them down and putting them away and ignoring them, okay? Our task is to actually effectively think about how do we manage our emotions in a way that isn't gonna get in our way, right? That is gonna you know, be helpful for us and may also be helpful for our children, okay? So here are the five skills and we're gonna, you'll notice if you, when you get this slide presentation, there's not a whole lot of slides so we're gonna spend a reasonable amount of time really thinking about each, each one of these, okay? So we're gonna talk about being aware of vulnerabilities. We're gonna talk about really connecting with your primary emotion. We're gonna talk about practicing self-validation. We're gonna talk about a wonderful skill that is helpful in the moment called the stop skill. And then we're gonna talk about living some of the DBT assumptions that are gonna help you along the way. Okay. So the first thing to be aware of that I think is really helpful in managing emotions, and these are some of my favorite skills um, in DBT, which is being aware of vulnerabilities, okay? We call this our ABC please skills, okay? So often what happens, okay, is the more emotionally vulnerable we are, the more emotionally reactive we are. And this goes for all of us. And this starts at a really young age, right? So. This is where, you know, the word hangry comes from, right? There are basic emotional vulnerabilities that are going to make it harder for us in times of stress, okay? So there's two parts to what's really, really important about being aware of vulnerabilities, okay? The first one is you have to know what the vulnerabilities are. And the second one is that you actually have to be aware of them, okay? Because often people will go back and they'll say like, I don't know why, you know, I got so upset or I know these skills and I don't know why I responded the way I did. And often what happens is that we're entering into a situ situation where we're not aware, we're not connected to sort of a lack of balance in what we call our vulnerability factors that are understandably going to make it harder for us to sort of manage the tornado, right? The emotional tornado, challenging news. Um, difficult situations because we're not at our baseline. Okay? So I like to go think about the ABC please skills as like our emotional foundation. Okay. And that is like, if you think about it, the foundation of the building is that you want to figure out sort of what, you know, how do I keep that foundation steady? So when the fat, you know, the high winds or the tornadoes come that I can do the best I can to stay steady. Okay. So here are the things that I want you to pay attention to. So the first thing is one of the things that keeps us emotionally steady is accumulating positives, okay? Marsha Linehan, who created DBT, says you have to sort of live an antidepressant life, okay? So you can't wait for good things to happen. You have to pay attention to joy and you have to do things that bring you joy. Now, one of the problems with this is that when life gets really hard, when kids are struggling, um, when you don't know what to do, when you're uh, burned out and emotionally exhausted, these are often some of the first things to go, right? That it becomes really hard to do anything that brings you joy or even find joy um, in, in things that you typically do. And we know that, we know that. And we still ask that people work to accumulate the positive, something positive. And that may be, you love coffee. And so you get up in the morning and you just mindfully drink your coffee, okay? It doesn't have to be big. It might mean that you like to garden and so you spend 10 minutes outside walking around your garden. But the task is to accumulate positives because by doing that, even small amounts of joy strengthen that foundation, okay? We also need to build mastery, okay? So we need things in our life that challenge us that we feel like we can accomplish, okay? And it cannot be parenting, okay? So often people will say, 
well, you know, I, I, I'm building mastery by, you know, learning new things to, to do to support my child. That's wonderful. But what we know about that is it tends to be a little bit too mood dependent, which is then when your child is doing well, it feels like you're really building a lot of mastery. And when your child is struggling, it doesn't feel the same. So, you know, we ask people to think about, you know, small things. And again, if you're in school, school often learning um, a new skill. Uh, if you're at work, often people build mastery at their jobs. They may do knitting. They may find a project at home, or you may just be checking things off your to-do list. Okay, But we need a sense of doing things that are difficult and being able to be successful at them. Okay? We need to cope ahead. So another thing that helps us be um, less vulnerable is when we know something is coming that is emotionally challenging, that we make a plan. Okay? So we don't go in without an idea of what we're going to do, but we make a plan. Okay. And sometimes when we get caught what ifing about what, you know, what's going to happen and what can I do, then we think about things like what's the worst case scenario. And then we make a plan for that. Okay. And then it begins to lighten the the load and the stress of the what if thinking. And what if anxiety is a huge vulnerability. It makes it very difficult to stay present and it makes it very hard to be able to um, take in all the information and problem solve difficult things. Okay, so that those are what we call our psychological um, ways to build, build mastery and be aware of uh, building mastery and doing things that manage our vulnerabilities. The next part is what we do physiologically, okay? And these are ones that day to day we need to keep in mind, okay? Because all of these things when they're out of balance tend to make us very, very emotionally vulnerable, which is gonna make it harder to manage our own emotions, right? Which is gonna make it harder to navigate challenging situations. So we have to treat physical illness, okay? When people are sick, particularly if you're an emotionally sensitive person, physical illness, right, tends to drop people's mood, okay? It tends to make it harder. Um, if you have family members, loved ones, children um, that are very sensitive and get sick, right, they often will feel more depressed or they can feel more hopeless, it's harder for them to use skills, just have a generally hard time. And again, most of us do, right? You know, if you have um, a headache, right? People tend to be more irritable, okay? So we need to treat the physical illness that we can. And if we can't, we have to really understand the impact that it has on us, right? So it might be like, you know, I'm, I have a headache. I've taken something. It's a migraine. There's not much I can do. I'm going to rest. But I know, right, that maybe I have shorter patience at that point, okay? exercise. Okay. So there's lots of, um, lots of data out there about endorphins from exercising and mood. Um, exercise is important for mood, right? It keeps it building that foundation. We need to either avoid mood altering substances, or we need to be mindful of those substances, because again, mood altering substances are often going to make us much more vulnerable. Sleep. Okay. So sleep um, is a huge one for all of us, okay? And many people that come to DBT have a very hard time sleeping. And many family members that are understandably worried about their loved ones have a hard time sleeping, okay? We've all had the experience where we have gone periods of time not sleeping well, and then we have one good night's sleep and we think, wow, like the world looks different, okay? So we need to know, again, if we're not sleeping, Okay, we're going to be much more likely to have challenges, basically managing managing emotions. Okay, and eating, right? You know, eating, you know, balanced, eating enough, eating consistently. And for some people eating sort of the right foods, some people are much more sensitive to certain foods. They have allergies, sensitivities. They do better, you know, with food that they prepare. They do better from food from certain places. So to get really curious about, you know, balanced eating, right? Now, the very tricky thing about these physiological skills um, is that once one goes, it's very, very easy for it to go like dominoes, right? So it's like, I don't sleep one night, so I don't exercise because I'm too tired. And then I come home and I don't want to cook. So I order out food that I know sort of doesn't work well for me. 
and then I have work to do. So I take ca I drink caffeine too late, right? And so you can see how they all sort of cascade. The good news is that with awareness and balance, as quickly as these skills fall off, you can build them right back up, okay? And you start to feel more steady, okay? So again, this is something that is the first step in figuring out how um, to help your emotions not get in the way, which is, again, it's a mindful practice of your vulnerabilities so that we go into situations knowing, you know, is this one where I feel steady or is this one where I'm more vulnerable? And if I'm more vulnerable, you may think about timing. You might say, it's actually I'm not in the best place to have this conversation right now. Right? I know that I'm more emotionally vulnerable. Like, let's try this a different time. Okay. So this kind of awareness is hugely helpful. Okay. So the next question, this goes a little bit to the email. Okay. The next question is, we got to know how we feel. Okay. And um, too often, um, as parents, we move into what we call secondary emotions. Okay. We got to find the primary emotion. So primary emotions are, you know, I like to think about primary emotions as really like neurological events, right? So there's information that comes into our brains, right? Our brain processes it without us doing much about it. Okay. <laughs> and then it produces an emotion, right? And it produces an emotion because emotions have functions. Okay. Emotions give us information. They communicate information to other people and they motivate action. Right. So we really need our brain to be producing these things. OK, so we there's not really much you can do. Your brain produces the primary emotion. OK, primary emotions. There's a lot of different schools of thought around primary emotions. Um, there's some people that think there's five. There's some people that think there's seven. Marsha Linehan thinks there's ten. Um, she has a lot of primary emotions, um, sadness, joy, uh, fear, anger, jealousy, envy, uh, guilt, shame, disgust. And then she goes back and forth between love and surprise. So she's a lot of different primary emotions. Okay. Now, primary emotions are the emotions that actually give us the most information. Now, um, when Kids are like zero to about, I don't know, three or four. They live in primary emotions. Primary emotions last, you know, about 60 seconds. And so often we think, oh, they're getting distracted. But really what's happening is in their brains, an emotion is just running its course, you know, so you'll see them, they'll be sad, they'll be happy, they'll be mad, something will happen, they'll be happy again, right? They'll be scared or startled. Um they don't have the brain capacity to move out of what we call primary emotions, okay? Now, once the, you know, the brain then has sort of lots of little developmental surges and one happens around, you know, four or five, um, where we begin to be able to think about our feelings, okay? So we think, you know, we, we then, you know, you know, I watch it in my kids, right? So one of my kids will take, some, you know, my older one will take something from my younger one and when he was really little, he just got mad or sad. Um, but then he got older and he thought, this always happens to me. Like he always takes it. He always gets what he wants, right? So now what he is, is he's in a secondary emotion, okay? Secondary emotions hang around for a long time because what we're doing is we're thinking about the primary emotion and we're kind of perpetuating it. We're kind of cooking it, okay? So you know, he started out mad that his brother took the toy, right? And then he moved into feeling mad and maybe feeling sad and then moving into, you know, it's not fair and justice. And, you know, he, he could really prolong his misery for a long time, okay? Just by thinking about it, just by thinking about it. So what we know about secondary emotions is it could be the same emotion, right? So it could be that I feel sad and then I just think about all the other times that I was sad, right? Or it can actually be a different emotion, okay? And one of the ones that's really, really common is anger. So in general, once you're in sort of mid-adolescence to mid to late adolescence and adulthood, anger tends to be a secondary emotion, okay? 
And secondary emotions, I like to think about, they're not, it's not not real, it's just not the whole story. And you really need to figure out the whole story, which is that primary emotion, okay? Now, anger is an interesting one because a lot of it has to do with sort of how we're socialized, right? So in some families, sadness is tolerated and anger isn't. So you don't see a lot of anger. In some families, anger, uh, sadness is uh, not tolerated, but anger is. So when people get sad, they quickly shift into anger and it's often outside of people's awareness, okay? So anger is another one for parents that's often paired with fear. Okay, so often what can happen is that when we get frightened by something, when we, you know, can't get our kids to do, like we can't get them to get up and go to school and we know that if they're missing school or work, they're going to feel worse, right? They might feel shame or disappointed in themselves or like they're missing out on something, right? And so often what can happen is that parents can approach their kids leading with anger, right? And this is not so effective, right? It's not so effective because it doesn't usually get us too far, right? When we lead with anger with somebody, but also actually anger isn't the feeling that we're the predominant feeling, it's fear, okay? And so we gotta figure out what these are, okay? And I often will tell parents a really nice exercise is if you notice anger show up in with your, with your child or with your loved one, or kind of any time, take a pause and check in and see if it is actually the primary emotion, okay? And there's lots of examples of this. Like, you know, often people when they're driving, um, if they get cut off, they have a surge of anger. Some people, right? A big surge of anger. You know, this is like the road rage situation. But often it's actually that anger is secondary and we're afraid, right? Actually, if you look at our physiology, your heart is beating and actually you're afraid that actually somebody was going to hit your car or you were going to hit your hit them or someone was going to get hurt, right? And so the primary is fear. The secondary was anger, right? And the problem is that when we lead with the secondary and it's not the whole story, um, it's less effective. And it also means we get less validation and understanding from people. So how do you get to the primary emotion? You use what we call the skill in DBT is mindfulness of current emotion, and we have a sort of training wheels version of it to break it down, and it's called sun wave no not, okay? And this is an incredible way um, of figuring out what that primary emotion is, which one of those are there. It works beautifully with anger. Um, and so I would encourage people when, when you do this skill, write it out in the beginning if it's a new skill for you, because it actually can walk through these steps. Okay. So <laughs> the first place we start is with our sensations. Okay. Your body holds a lot of clues about how you feel. So we often, I'll tell people to do a body scan. You can kind of, you know, start from your head and go down to your toes, you know, but check out areas like, you know, where are you holding tension? You clenching your fists, you have butterflies in your stomach, um, is your jaw, you know, is your jaw tight? Are your shoulders tense? Um, you know, do you feel tingling somewhere in your body? You know, what, what do you feel? Go dig around and figure out what are those sensations. Once you've figured out the sensation, you need to move to your urges. Okay. Now, because one of the functions of emotion is to motivate action, all emotions have associated action urges. They make us want to do things. Sometimes they make us want to not do things. Um, so we want to think about and ask yourself, like, what do I want to do? Do I want to run? Do I want to yell? Do I want to cry? Do I want to hide? Do I want to throw something? What do I want to do? Okay. So the, the beauty of this is that once you have the sensations and you have the urges, you probably are going to be able to name that emotion. Okay. We know that simply naming an emotion helps bring down the intensity. You know, it's not going to make it all the way down, but it just begins to knock down the intensity a little bit, right? It's helpful to understand what's going on with us. Okay. Once you have named the emotion, the task is to ride the wave. So a model of emotion is that the emotion is prompted, okay? It goes up in intensity and peaks like a wave, okay? And then it goes down, right, to the shore, okay? So that's how it works. So what we want people to do is ride it, okay? And the nice way to do it, if you're familiar with 
mindfulness is to just observe and describe and you can go right back up to your sensations and urges, okay? You can go right back up to your, like I notice tension in my neck. I notice sweatiness in my palms. I notice my thinking is going quickly. So pay attention that I'm noticing things, okay? So I'm taking it, making it a little bit separate from myself. And I'm saying things like, I notice the sensation, okay? It's really boring, okay? That is the beauty of it. That allows the emotion to run its course without us doing the things that make it shift into the secondary emotion, okay? The no not is what's going to help you as you observe and describe. So we're not going to do the things that amp up emotions and we're not going to suppress them. So we're not going to tell us we tell ourselves we can't feel something and we're not going to judge it, right, as like stupid or too sensitive. We're not going to crank it up in any way, okay? We're just going to observe and describe it and let it run its course, okay? We're also going to remind ourselves that our, you're not your emotion. So we like to say things like, you know, I feel sad as opposed to I am sad. It sends a really nice message to the brain that this is not a permanent state, but something that can come and go, okay? And we want to remind ourselves that the emotion won't last forever, right? So often in times where you feel very deep emotions, it can feel like it will last forever. And we need to remind ourselves that it won't. Okay? So your first two skills is that you're going to go into situations really paying attention to things that make you emotionally vulnerable. Okay, And then we're going to pay attention to figuring out that primary emotion. Okay, So taking the pause and practicing the sun wave so that you actually know what it is you're feeling. So if you're afraid, right, you need to understand that because that will inform effective next steps, right? If you're sad, that may effectively lead you in a different direction, okay? But we don't, we, we want to be really aware of what that primary emotion is. Ah, now we're going to practice self-validation, okay? Often, um, Parents get very, very skilled, especially if you've done family connections or you've done BBT, they get very skilled at validating, right? They learn to validate their loved one's emotional experience to make sense of it, right? Given who they are, that how they feel makes a lot of sense. They tend to have a harder time doing it for themselves, okay? Self-validation can be very hard for people. Um, it is critical, right? In the face of your own strong emotions, the best thing you can do after you figure out what it is, is make sense of it, right? And allow yourself to have that feeling, okay? Which I can understand that in the face of your loved one struggling can be hard, right? It can be hard, but by noticing and identifying your primary emotion and validating it, you will begin to regulate how you feel, okay? So here are just quick steps on how, do you, how you self-validate, right? So you name the feeling, right? And you can identify what contributed to it, right? You can express understanding and acceptance towards your feeling, right? You have to make sense of it, right? Why does it make sense that I feel this way, okay? This is critical. This is the heart of validation, right? Is the idea that how you feel makes sense given who you are and the situation in front of you, right? It makes sense, okay? You're going to normalize your emotional experience, right? This is a form of validation. If anyone has been in DBT and learned lots of different ways to validate, one of them is, is to normalize it, right? Is to often to think about it. Yes, but does it make sense? Would other people feel the same way that I do? And the answer is almost all of the time, yes, okay? Then you need to affirm yourself, right? You need to remind yourself that it's okay, right? You need to be kind to yourself gentle, right? And non-judgmental, right? Once we start invalidating ourselves, we start cranking up the intensity of our emotions, right? The more our emotions get in, intense, right? The less effective we are, right? Because that's where we start to flip into emotion mind becomes very, very, very hard. All right. The next thing that you're going to do, this is a wonderful distress tolerance skill. Okay. This is the stop skill. Okay. This is um, a skill that looks super easy, um, but that can be very hard to practice. Okay. 
The stop skill is the skill that you're going to use when you feel like things are getting heated up, right? It's like almost like the timeout skill. And I'll tell you how DBT makes it a little bit more comprehensive than just the timeout. Many people in therapy or family therapy have learned sort of like, okay, anybody can call a timeout when things are um, kicking up in intensity. And this is similar to this, but we're going to add mindfulness to it. Okay. But the stop skill is a distress tolerance skill that's going to help us pause. Okay. Before we maybe move too quickly into something that maybe is going to be ineffective. Okay. Because it's being driven by emotions that we're not either aware of that are too intense right? And that all of a sudden the emotion is driving us and not our own wisdom, okay? So you're going to do the stop skill. The first thing you're going to do is when you start to notice, right, that the emotions are getting in your way in an ineffective way, you're going to stop. And I tell people to like literally stop, stop moving, stop talking, just take a pause, right? And take a couple breaths, okay? Once you've stopped, you're going to take a step back. Okay. You can take a, literally take a step back. Like I need to take a break, right. And, you know, take a break for five minutes, take a break for an hour, or your step back can be much more subtle, which is just asking for a moment, right. To take a couple deep breaths, see if you can slow down your physiology, right. Maybe here you would do your quick sun wave and get a sense of what you're feeling. Okay. As, and then you move into the observe. Okay. So <laughs> You're going to take a moment and you're going to think about what is going on for me within my body, right? Within my mind. So maybe you, you got that information from your sun wave, but also what's going on around me, right? What might be going around, on, you know, for the other person or, just, you know, the, whatever is going literally around, like, is it really loud? Is it really stressful? Do you need a different place, right? What's going on? Because often the more dysregulated we get, the more tunnel vision we get, right? So the more kind of focused in we get. And so we don't see, right? We don't step back and observe. And so the stop, the, the O in the stop skill has us just sort of expand our awareness. Just take a moment and think about like, okay, what's going on all around me and what's going around, uh, around uh, for me? right? What's, what's happening for me? And then you proceed mindfully. Okay. So this is where, and I always talk about when uh, I teach mindfulness, that mindfulness allows you to sit in the space, right? Between the urge to do something and acting on it. Okay. Often when we're driven by emotion, there's no space. Okay. And that's when people say like, oh, I don't know why I did this. I can't believe I did this. I don't know why I said this, right? Because there's no space and it was driven by our emotions, right? What observing and being mindful does is it starts to give you a choice, right? You've, you've observed everything, you know what's going on within you, you kind of know what's going on around you, and then you make a choice, okay? So you proceed mindfully. So this stop skill allows you to pause, okay? And also practice your mindfulness. You may find in the stop skill wow, you know what? My emotions are running too high right now to be effective moving forward, right? Or you might find, okay, now that I've paused and I've found my primary emotion and I've validated, right, my fear, okay, it's going down a little bit. Now I think I can move forward more effectively and maybe lead with that primary emotion or problem solve based on that primary emotion. So you see all these skills linked together. All right. The final thing that you're going to do is you're going to live the DBT assumptions about patients and families. Now, these are assumptions if you do DBT that we ask people to abide by. And we understand that these are assumptions. So they are, we're, we're saying, just I just need you to live by these assumptions. We're not trying to prove them or disprove them, right? We're just saying this in, in DBT, when you practice, this is what we want you to, um, to live by. Now, what I found as a DBT therapist now for mm, 17 or 18 years, um, that actually, if I live my life using these assumptions, I stay more regulated. 
right? I just stay more regulated, okay? And you're gonna see as we go through. And again, these assumptions are hard to live. And, you know, we violate the assumptions all the time. That's just what happens because emotions get in the way. And then we're like, oh, I completely didn't hold on to that assumption. But we go back to it. Okay, that's what living these are. This is not being perfect. This is using these assumptions, right? Because often we make judgments and we make assumptions that are very problematic, right? We make assumptions that add sort of emotional fuel to the fire, right? And we end up amping up our, our own experience, which makes it ineffective and quite miserable for ourselves, okay? So I find that if you just live these, um, it's actually quite helpful in being less reactive and it helps us regulate. So what are they? You'll also notice if you do DBT, so the D in DBT for people that don't do DBT is called, is dialectical, okay? The study of dialectics is the idea that two things that are opposing can be true at the same time and that there are multiple truths, right? So things can be contradictory. We, we tend to use the word and instead of the word but. So you're gonna see some of these things here that sometimes it's like, wait, how can it be both? It can be both, okay, in DBT. So the first assumption that we live by is that patients and families, and if you wanna live your life like this, I just say everybody, um, is doing the best that they can. Okay. Now, this is probably the hardest one um, to practice when everything is going well, it's very, very easy. Um, and then when things are not going as well and people are being less effective, this can be a much harder one to live by, okay? So what this means is that in any given situation, given the factors that bring you to that situation, okay, you're doing the best that you can, okay? Which means <laughs> on um, a day that you sleep, you are doing the best that you can at work. And on the day that you don't sleep, you're still doing the best that you can. And the day that you don't sleep, it may not look, the best may not look exactly the same, okay? But what we're gonna believe is that people are doing the best that they can given what brings them to the situation or the moment that they're in. Okay? And this can also be really hard because often we see people in a similar situation, right? And so sometimes they're effective and sometimes they're ineffective, right? And when they're ineffective, it sometimes is, hard to believe that they're doing the best that they can, right? But what happens to you when you start believing that people you care about or people in your life are not doing the best that they can, right? Often what happens is we get emotionally dysregulated, right? We start thinking, you know, why they're not doing well. And I tell you, we think when they're, when we're thinking about why they're not doing well, we often are not giving them the benefit of the doubt because we're moving deeper and deeper into our emotions, right? I know you can do better. You're not trying hard enough, right? And so what happens? So it's damaging to the relationships, but it also actually makes us feel more miserable. So instead, we just say patients are doing the best that they can. Now, people often say, okay, that's it? No. At the same time, right? Patients and families or people must do better, try harder, and be more motivated to change, right? So on the day, where the best that I could do was not so good, okay? I gotta do better the next time. I gotta think about it and learn and be compassionate to myself and I gotta do better, right? And so I'm moving in between. I'm holding those dialectics that at the same time, that was the best that I could do, but I gotta do better, right? I don't know, the best that I could do when my kid came running up the stairs secretly behind my husband's back in the middle of this. I probably could have done better. I could have been more validating, right? So I'm like, okay, you know, the next time it happens and it'll happen, um, you know, I can do better, right? And I'm going to hold that my husband who knew I was up here, right, was also doing the best that he can. You know, it was the best that he could do. And, you know, look, my little six-year-old slid by him. So that's what we're going to, and then I feel better thinking about it that way, right? Then I don't get so upset about it. And that's what this is about. This is about helping me manage my emotions in maybe challenging situations, okay? And not doing the things that enhance my emotions that make me suffer, which will likely make me ineffective, okay? So we're gonna believe that people wanna improve, okay? So 
one of the things that can happen um, for people, for family members that have, for parents and um, that have family members and loved ones that struggle with emotion dysregulation, um, any of these kinds of self-destructive behaviors, it's a long journey. It's a long journey. It's not a linear journey. There's a lot of ups and downs. There's feeling like things are getting better. And then all of a sudden, that feeling of kind of going off a cliff that, oh, we're right back where we started, right? We're back at an old behavior. And it's easy for us to start to believe that our loved one doesn't want to improve. Okay? And then you have to think about what does it feel like to hold that belief? Okay? It's very painful. It's very, very painful, right? And we suffer, right? And maybe we suffer in sadness and maybe we end up in our secondary emotion of anger, right? And that doesn't feel good either. And then we become very ineffective, right? Or, you know, it depletes us, okay? So we hold in our mind that even if we notice the thoughts that maybe it feels like people don't wanna get better, that fundamentally part of human nature is that we wanna improve, okay? We are also believing that we need to learn new behaviors in all contexts of our life, okay? So we've got to be skillful everywhere. Um, and, you know, that's that's part of, you know, again, that works with DBT. We provide coaching. Um, but we've got to remember that people have to learn to do new skills in all be, in all areas of their life. And that can be hard, right? And that's part of that up and down journey. I can be really effective at home with my friends and struggle at my job. And then I lose my job. And I need to remember that's a new context that requires me to use more skills. Okay. We believe that patients and families cannot fail. So you can keep it with DBT or you can get rid of the DBT, but we're going to keep in our mind that patients and families don't fail. Okay. We're going to also remember that People may not have caused all of their own problems, but they have to solve them anyway, okay? So we empower people and parents and families and patients to solve problems, even if it's not their fault, right? They, they didn't cause them. And we do a lot of validation recognizing that, okay? And then we also remember that the lives of people that are suicidal or with BPD are unbearable as they are currently being lived, okay? This helps us remain compassionate, right? When you walk around from a position of compassion, you're gonna feel much better than a place of anger and resentment, okay? And so we go back and we practice that, right? And then we can be much more compassionate to ourselves as well. So there's you go, you've got your five skills. Um, and again, this is not about, as you can see, this is not about stuffing emotions, okay? Sometimes it's effective to share emotions with your loved one and, and sometimes it's not, right? And that's a mindfulness practice, okay? So it's not an all or nothing. But before we are gonna you know, share those emotions, we have to figure out how to manage them effectively. Because what we want is that we don't want our emotions driving our behavior in ways that are ineffective, right? We want them to drive our behavior in ways that are effective. And that primary emotion, finding that primary emotion is gonna be helpful. But we also have to know if those vulnerability factors are high, we need to take care of ourselves, right? And we need to be mindful of the positions that we put ourselves in. And we have to be mindful and kind about our own areas of vulnerability. Okay. You've got a stop skill that's a great in the moment skill. Okay. And we've got to focus on validation and self validation. So you can validate your loved one, but it's not going to be as effective if you're not validating your own emotions. Okay. Thank you. So hopefully we have enough time um, for questions. Thanks, Jillian. That was awesome. It's always good to, to hear the skills um, and to hear them presented different ways. I personally found that sun wave no not effective. Um, and that reminder that we're not our emotions. Um, I know, I think you, you can't hear that too many times. Um, I did want to comment to everyone. We have had we have over 700 folks on, on this webinar tonight. Um, so those of you who thought they were alone, 
Um, trust us, you are not alone. Um, you are very much in good company. Um, Julie, I'm wondering if you can talk about how the skills you've talked about tonight are applicable for uh, beyond parents. We've had a few folks asking if these are only for parents. Yeah, so the, these are skills for everybody. Um, the beauty of DBT, actually even clinicians. So <laughs> when you become a DBT therapist, they you have to basically commit to using the skills that you teach. So, you know, I use these skills um, you know, my skills also break down like everybody else's. Um, but, you know, I've worked with all sort, you know, um, hus husbands and wives, grandparents, aunts and uncles, um, foster parents, families, uh, family friends. Um, you know, these are skills that work for everybody. It actually that and they will work in all of your relationships, which is great. Um, it doesn't even have to be with somebody that is um you know, struggling with emotion dysregulation, like you would be amazed um, at what what goes on with people if you use these skills. We have people that use it at work. Um, you know, it's often a little bit easier, um, but use them for everybody. This is not just parents. And I apologize if I was overly focused on parents. I do a lot of adolescent work, so I'm kind of in the and a lot of parents. I, I see a lot of parents, so uh, I get a little caught in that. Oh, I think it's okay. It was in the title too. That's where, you know, we put a focus there too, but there are some who aren't and, you know, I think it is. Yeah. To, to look at that. Can you talk a little bit more about mastery and, and how we, we build that mastery, you know, we're challenged with something. How do we go about learning something? And it's layered with all the juggling that people are doing. There's just so much going on and you add to that, you know, someone who's emotionally dysregulated, how do I go and build my mastery? <laughs> yeah, so this is the challenge, right? Um, you know, it, and you have to sort of like look at your life because it may be that you have mastery built into it and you just need to keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, for some people making a, ch like I love to-do lists. I love, and I do them like the old fashioned way on a piece of paper and I make a big line through it. I don't even like the little box with the check mark. Like I want to cross it off. You know, that so, you know, sometimes it's just that feeling of like, I'm getting through stuff, I'm getting stuff done. And I think when you're really overwhelmed um, with managing, you know, a family member that's struggling and, and just life, it can feel like you're kind of always behind. So sometimes you can reframe that as my mastery for today is getting these three things done, right? Other times your mastery might be at, you know, work or school. <laughs> and some people actually feel like what they need is like a hobby or a task to do. So I've had people like, you know, just I, I've got a 5,000 piece puzzle and like, I want to get this puzzle done. And I do four or five minutes a day, you know, I learning a new skill, you know, um, sometimes people will say, you know, I want to run a 5k and I want to run a 5k in a year. And so I'm going to start by walking and that's going to be my exercise. And then I'm going to do some jogging. Um, lots of people learn to crochet or knit or um, woodworking. You know, it's it's just finding something and then finding the thing that's going to fit in your life so that you both get the, the benefit from it, but it doesn't become another thing that's so overwhelming that then it's ineffective. That makes a lot of sense. Another one that was coming up is how do we keep calm or how do we apply these skills when our kids are super emotional, you know, you've got that, those extremes of that rage, the despair, it's not the everyday emotions, but how, how do we, you know, you see skills in those extreme situations that we often find ourselves in. Yeah. So um, what we know, um, if you are at all emotionally sensitive and you are near somebody that is dysregulated you will notice that you begin to get dysregulated, right? So you'll start to notice your heart rate going, right? Or maybe you'll get anxious or you'll get hot, right? So in those moments where people are very, very dysregulated in any di direction, right? You, that your mindfulness is your friend. Um, you need to be, start to be aware of how you're feeling, right? And then what, what you need, right? Breathing is amazing a little bit of oxygen, right, to your brain um, will help you regulate. 
right? So if you're somebody who is, you know, for me, what happens when I'm with somebody that's very angry, if someone's very angry in my office, my heart rate gets going very, very quickly, right? Once your heart rate gets going, you've activated your fight or flight loop. It's going, right? So my heart rate is beating, my heart rate's going up, which is sending the message to my brain. My brain is sending the message to my body that I'm in danger and I'm looping and looping and looping, right? So for me in those moments, I use what's called the um, part of the tip skill, which is our physiological distress tolerance skill. And I can breathe my heart rate down, right? So you do a little bit of pace breathing, which is any kind of breathing where the exhale is longer than the inhale. Doesn't matter, make up whatever numbers you wanna make up. You could inhale for five and exhale for seven. That will begin to slow your heart rate down. But then you have to think about what is effective. So can you be effective in that moment with that person? Or do you need to sort of get regulated and come back in, right? So if people are very, very dysregulated in, a, in an up way, so like yelling or screaming or a very activated, you know, you have to be present, you have to breathe, you have to know what you're feeling, and you might have to articulate to that person, you know, I'm going to go take a break, you know, if I'm going to come back in 10 minutes and see if... Um, you want to talk or I can help you with skills, right? So it's, it's about awareness, right? Often when people are very, very dysregulated, like at eight, nines and tens, we tend to get involved in ways that aren't helpful because when people are that dysregulated, they're not thinking. And what's fascinating is what we tend to do is try to engage their thinking, right? We try to like offer skills or do some pro like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? And when people are very dysregulated, usually they're not that interested in the problem solving, right? And you may be escalating things. You may, you're asking people to think in times where their thinking is essentially offline, right? The more dysregulated we are, the less thinking we're able to do. That's sort of the definition. So you're, when people are very, very dysregulated in either direction, your task is to check your emotions, be really clear about where you are, and pretty much your only skill is validation. So you're going to validate yourself, you're going to validate the other person, right? And then when their emotions come down more, you may be able to engage and offer some, you know, is there anything I can do? Would it be helpful um, you know, if I sat with you or, you know, we did some skills? I love your statement. Mindfulness is our friend. Yes. Um, for, but for some folks, they still don't really understand what mindfulness is. Can you just kind of give a quick crash course on what it actually is for those who don't understand? They, they're hearing about it all the time and they're being told to do everything mindfully, but what does that really mean? Okay. Do you have chat power? Can you type a definition into the chat while I say it? Because then people are always- We do. Okay, good. I'm going to say a definition. If you could pop it into the chat, because often people will say, oh, can you repeat it? Um, so I like John Kabat-Zinn's definition of mindfulness, which is paying attention on purpose in a particular way and without judgment. Okay, so mindfulness is about attention. It's about paying attention. It's about being non-judgmental right? It's about sitting in that space. So we're not doing, you know, you don't have to move into action. It's all deliberate and by choice, okay? And with awareness, okay? So you can really think about it. Mindfulness is a practice of attention. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that strong emotions are the number one hijacker of your attention, okay? So <laughs> the more, so like, Anybody who might um, be have a hard time sleeping at night and like ruminate, like we just think over and over again, or like we perseverate, we repeat the same thing over and over again. That's an attentional problem that's driven by your emotions. Okay. So you're having a strong feeling like usually we don't do that when we're not worried about something, right. Or when we're not sad about something, right. We have, we're not guilty about something. We have a feeling right? And then we get locked in on it, okay? When we're mindful, we're able to say, wow, like I'm really, I've noticed that I'm just looping around and around on like what I'm going to do at work tomorrow in the meeting that I have with my boss. And then what I notice is, okay, that's not effective. I need to turn my attention 
to something else, right? And so maybe you um, put your attention on a podcast or maybe you count backwards from a hundred by sevens or you shift your attention. So that's a mindfulness. I noticed that my attention, um, you know, I, I noticed where my mind was going that was ineffective and I turned my mind, mindfulness, right? The awareness and the turn to shift my attention. Then your mind's going to get pulled back to the rumination. You're going to notice it and you're going to come back. Okay. The, the challenge is, right, that those strong emotions are very powerful that pull our attention, right? And that's what happens with people that, you know, get dysregulated that um, come to DBT, right? That their mind is pulled constantly by strong emotions and sometimes self destructive behaviors. Okay. And as parents, our attention, whether, you know, our attention is often pulled to our children's suffering or our husband or wife's suffering or our grandchild suffering or our best friends. Like we're, you know, that's going to pull our attention. And so mindfulness allows us to be present in the moment, notice when we're somewhere else and turn our attention deliberately to a more effective place. Great. Thank you. So I want to take us back almost to the very start Sure. Um, with this. So we talked about at the very start, it's about, you know, a lot of times parents, we're not taught how to manage our, our emotions and we suppress them. Um, what happens when we learn how to start expressing our emotions or we are that person that wears our heart on our sleeves and we have no problem um, expressing our emotions to the point that we overshare? Mm -hmm. How do we kind of rein it in and, and what is oversharing, you know, for, like, where are we on that spectrum, right? We're, we're kind of here where we're not sharing anything here. We're oversharing and we want to try to find that balance, but how do we know where that is? Yeah. So this is, this it's a great question. Um, it's a little bit personal, right? I mean, so, you know, I think, um, you know, what we share, I think there's no perfect answer because how much you share in different is going to differ for different relationships, right? So there are going to be some relationships in which it's very, very important to share more um, because it breeds connection and because the other person we know is able to validate and recognize how we feel, right? And so it's a what we you know it's a safe place. It's a comforting place to share, right? And then, you know, there's other, there's other times in which we're going to share less. So in some ways, again, the answer is mindfulness. Um, it's, it's really truly, it's, it's paying attention, right? And it's asking yourself, what is, a, what sharing is effective in this relationship and in this context and at this time, right? So sometimes we have the urge to share something and it's probably a great thing to share, but not at that moment. Right. Because maybe the other person isn't going to hear it, maybe because it's going to be invalidating to the other person. Like if I share, you know, many people, you know, validation is 100 percent about the other person's experience. Right. So one of the sort of the, the tricky parts of validation is often we can inadvertently hijack it by saying, well, when that happened to me. Right. And now all of a sudden that what they need is validation about how hard it is. But I've now sort of hijacked it and made it about my experience. And it's not that sharing is a bad thing, but it may not work in that context. So again, it's about mindfulness, about like, when is it that I share? When is it that I don't share? And again, what's the function of sharing? Like, am I sharing because it's like driven by emotion and I can't not share? Am I sharing for connection? Am I sharing for the better of the relationship? Right. So again, and this is what mindfulness helps you do. It helps you slow down. And again, it's sitting in that space between the urge. Do I share or do I, I want to share? Do I, okay. Is that, you know, if I sit in that little space of the urge, I want to share. It's like, okay, well, is it effective to share? And am I going to feel good at the end? And are they going to feel good at the end? You know, or is this just, I have an urge to share, but it's like, not that this isn't the right time. Thank you so much. I think that's going to be it for our questions for tonight. Um, thank you all for participating. And Jillian, thank you so much for all your words of wisdom um, and taking all of our questions on the fly. Um, we will see you at our next expert series.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.